Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is the nature of higher consciousness. We'll be focusing on the last book written by the late great psychologist Robert Ornstein, the author of more than 20 books, including the classics, The Psychology of Consciousness and The Evolution of Consciousness. His newest and last book is called God 4.0, and it was co-authored with his wife, Sally who was his spouse for more than 35 years before he died in 2018. Both Robert and Sally Ornstein have been deeply involved in managing and founding the Institute for the Study of Human Knowledge, an organization devoted, amongst other things, to fostering the Sufi teachings of the late Idris Shah. Sally is based in California, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Sally. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. You worked for years taking Bob Ornstein's final manuscript and editing it, and I'm sure you had a, a role in writing it as, as well, and uh, bringing it to publication several years after his death. So that really brings makes you a, uh, an author of a major book. In a minor way. I mean, the, the main ideas were all Bob's, not mine. Um, he spent uh, quite a few years trying to find how to describe, you know, he always worked intuitively. So he was always looking for a way to describe psychologically and scientifically what he intuited. And I think just before, probably about six months before he died, he said to me, it's about connection. It's definitely about connection. And he and he got it because since the, the 60s and 70s, there's been so much more information on neurobiology, on our religious histories, that he could tie these ends together and come up with the neurobiology of higher consciousness, really. I was very impressed with one of the statements he made uh, in in the book in which in which he said in the last 50 years or so I think since his his first great book the psychology of consciousness there's been more research on the nature of consciousness than there had been in the entire history of humanity up until then. Yes, I think that's true. Um but also, the religious histories have come to the fore too. People like Karen Armstrong and Saunders have have found um, the connection between religious histories and con higher consciousness. I think it was Karen Armstrong who said that the um, most characteristic aspect of the human race <clears throat> is their search for transcendence. And that's really the key to the book. Well, we'll certainly dig into that, but I think it would be very useful for our audience today, many of whom are not familiar with your late husband's work, to talk a little bit about his life and his career first. Okay, fine. Well, I know, for example, both you and Bob were deeply involved in the work of Idris Shah, the author of, oh, I don't know, 30 or 40 books of Sufi stories, delightful stories. That's correct. Uh, um, that's, in fact, how we met. Um, I met I met Bob at a, a lecture on um, the healing brain and higher consciousness, I think it was, in London, and um, that was... Um, run by um, and the Institute for Cultural Research, which at the time Idris Shah was director of, and I was one of the um, handlers of the lecture, of the lecturers, looking after the lecturers. So that's how we actually met. And that was when he had written um, The Psychology of Consciousness and talked about 
the teaching stories that Shah had published as particularly relevant um, in in the way they activated the right hemisphere of the brain. And that's um, really uh, expanded now into what we're talking about now is the same thing, only we know more about it. We know the neurobiology of it. So in a sense, now we can take all the emotion out of it and focus on how it works and that it's latent in all of us and that we can develop it. I think it's probably fair to say that Bob was most known for his work on the uh, bilateral uh, hemispheres and the difference between the left and right hemispheres of the brain. That's right. He worked with Joseph Bogan and Roger Sperry back in the 60s and 70s, and he took that work and um, melded it with his um, interest in, in Sufi ideas and Eastern metaphysical ideas and, and mm. correlated the right hemisphere activation with alpha, alpha waves and with, metaf uh, with the activation of this now he calls second system of cognition with higher consciousness, really. And I know he also worked extensively with Joe Camilla, the pioneer of biofeedback research at the Langley Porter Institute in San Francisco. I, I think it was doing the same thing. And with biofeedback, you could switch into alpha rhythms, into that state of consciousness, which allows you to be more perceptive and intuitive. One of the you know, passages in, in the book, God 4.0, that really struck me is when Bob is describing his work at Langley Porter, I believe it was, and where they were implanting electrodes into the brain and doing surgery, and it was his responsibility to make sure the electrodes were correctly placed. And he had 10 different brains, cadaver brains, that he was looking at in order to make sure he understood the, the subtleties and nuances of brain anatomy. And he, he wrote that he got to recognize each brain as if it were a face, that you could identify the person by looking at the brain. Yes, uh, and, and his assistant could too, which I think is really interesting. I mean, it was a, Once you become used to it, it's like looking at my face versus your face. We have a nose, a mouth, uh, an eyes, but and they're in the same place, but we look totally different. So he had an appreciation for the uniqueness of the way individual brains work, and that that no two brains are exactly alike. And also in terms of uh, really how we work in normal consciousness. I mean, we all have the same biological inheritance, but as he describes in this book, we also have this imaginarium. Um, our experience, my experience is nothing, my experiences and memories are not the same as your experiences and memories, and they influence how we perceive the world as well as this bio biology that we all share. When we think about higher consciousness and when we think about God or the experience of God rather than metaphysical questions about the nature and existence of God, what Bob seems to be suggesting is it has an awful lot to do with the ability of the right hemisphere of the brain to see things holistically. Absolutely. And that's pretty much what he's been saying since the 1970s. But I think it's expanded now because thanks to the work of neurobiologists and a lot of work that's been done with um, the damaged, people with damaged brain and people who've taken drugs, you can they now know how this system works, sort of, and, and that it is on a continuum and that it belongs, it, it requires the deactivation of certain areas of the brain the something called the default, default mode network and another area called the right parietal lobe. The deactivation of those two things specifically enable the barriers to this other second system of consciousness to actually dissolve and leading to insights. And I think the important thing that he was stressing is that we all have this latent ability that can be developed and we know how to do it. And now is the time to do it because it will lead us to solve current global problems that we don't seem to be doing very well at right now.
The default mode network, and I think you said the right parietal lobe. That's right. The deactivation, which is surprising because before these studies, people generally thought like, for example, if you have all these wild, these great insights of we're all one and, you know, like they do with drugs, for example, that it meant it, it meant emotional excitement. But it's actually the reverse. It's deactivation. It's quieting down the brain. The default mode network um, was discovered, I think, by somebody called Michael Rachel. You probably know better than I do. And and it, it's where we go to, Bob describes it's when you're off working in a hammock and you've nothing nothing to do. You know, you're not thinking about, oh, the roast's burning or, or the children have to be picked up from school. You're just hanging out. And then all these these this kind of gossip in your head what does he think of me? What did I do that? Why did I say that? I'll probably do that after this after this interview too. My default mode will set in and I'll start <laughs> rabbiting on. But that is needs to be quiet, quieted. And when that's quieted, the the it the dissolving of it enables this switch to a higher form of perception, an intuitive perception. Similarly with the right parietal lobe. And really, I'm probably not saying this very well and but bob as you know says it's beautifully in the book so anybody who really wants to know needs to read the book not rely on me the idea is as as i gleaned it from the book that the right parietal lobe in particular is associated with our sense of awareness in the body and in the, in the physical reality here and now Yes, and where we are in space, where we are in time, and all, and and that's probably why. I mean, that is thought to be why people who have these other experiences say they think of them as outside space and time, because we know. I mean, we we make up time. It's totally our device that works quite well for us in normal consciousness, but it's nothing to do with objective truth or reality. Well, that's interesting because now I'm recalling the famous book by Ramdas called Be Here Now, in which he sort of suggests that higher consciousness is involved with the here and now. And what you seem to be suggesting is that actually it could be the opposite. It's letting go of here and now. I think, yes, it's spaceless, it's timeless, it's present. It's present, but it's, um, you know, I think it's experiences that poets like Jalaluddin Rumi and even T.S. Eliot recognize this. The place, Rumi says, the, my place is placeless. You know, there is no place. We, we just are. Or we are not, but it is, and we are one with it, so to speak. Well, William James came up with a, an idea about consciousness that the brain didn't produce consciousness. The brain acted sort of as a, a filter or a receiver of consciousness. That consciousness exists actually outside of the brain, and only a little trickle of it gets into our awareness just as much as we might need for to meet our survival needs. And that is normal consciousness, yes. Aldous Huxley describes it as a measly trickle. We take in a fraction of what is out there. I think in terms of visual wavelengths, it's a trillionth of what is out there that we actually use to see. So most of normal consciousness is made up inside the brain. I mean, so we have this, we've evolved this way just as frogs have. I think frogs can, they have four ways of looking at, at black and white so that they can catch bugs and know if a huge black thing comes, they've got to run like hell. So that's all they need to survive. Or well, similarly, we we, ha we have created this normal consciousness. It's evolved because it has served us marvelously at survival. I mean, look at us. We've, we've done very well at surviving. But what we're saying in the book, that now we are in need of to go beyond survival. We can do that very well, and we've done it even more than, than is probably, it's got to the stage where it's threatening us. So we have to look at a different way of looking at our, our world and to um, switch. And in switching, we need to cultivate selflessness. And I think that that's why in normal consciousness is what all the prophets and spiritual teachers have said to shun. 
In other words, to move beyond this normal survival me first mode into a more selfless, holistic view from which we can intuitively act and speak and think and make better solutions that are on a global level. Now, I think when you titled the book God 4.0, you're suggesting a, a whole new vision of religion and spirituality, which is centered on the, not on God somewhere outside dictating from the heavens above, but from within us. Absolutely. Bob used the term the, recognizing the within without. It's a combination. It's, it's actually connecting, connecting to, in, in some poems, they call it the, the other or the beloved. It's how to be absorbed by things beyond you, to switch, to have a realization that you are connected in a a totally different way. In other words, um, some of the, the Sufi poems, uh, poets, for example, Saadi of the 13th century talks about the human race is the fingers of one hand. We're all the fingers of one hand. And I think that's a good image. We, we are all connected. And we know that, really. I mean, we know that now, per, <clears throat> particularly with climate change. I mean, you can see that we are all connected. And I think that's something that this way of this way of um, understanding, this way of developing this consciousness that, that Bob is talking about will enable us to really um, understand the problems intuitively and um, come up with intuitive solutions. One of the unique features of your book is identifying what you call God 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0 that seem to be stages in the progress of humanity leading up to what you describe as God 4.0. What we discovered when we were doing the research is, as I said, this idea of transcendence has been with us ever since Paleolithic times 35,000 years ago. And we looked at the shamanic, the, the Paleolithic parietal caves in Lascaux. There's an anthropologist called David Lewis Williams who took the San people who are hunter-gatherers, the nearest we can get to what these people in Paleolithic times may have been like, and they took them, um, him and a prehistorian called Jean Claude, took these uh, 12 San people to the Paleolithic caves, and they recognized them as initiation sites where they uh, shamanic, ecstatic, the visionary journeys had taken place. So that was interesting. And I think that from there, and at that time, obviously, um, just like the San people, they were animistic. So there was uh, multiple spirits um, interacting with us on a, on an everyday level. There was no, as as someone I forget who said, there's no, there was no religion. It was all the spirits were here and and um, and interplay interacting with us constantly. So that was God point one point oh, and God two point oh is when you get um, the population increases. You get the Neolithic era, and you get. Um, into the Mesopotamia, which we talk about, 3,500 BCE, when there was gods for everything. As populations increased, it became uh, the the shamanic, the ecstatic, the experience of religion diminished because control was important. And that's when you get the gods, the hierarchical gods, the idea of a god for absolutely everything. They even had a god of the pig pen, I, uh, I seem to remember. And so that, that we called God 2.0. And then when we get to God 3.0, it's the axial age and the monolithic religions that we discuss when God, the idea of gods, all got absorbed into one God, and this God was both personal and universal. And then you, you from there, God 3.0, that's where you get the prophets, the major prophets of, of the uh, Judaism, Islam, uh, um, Christianity, and Islam. And then when you get to 4.0 is what 
what we're now calling about really the, the melding of science and religion when at last you know what exactly happens when you have these experiences that the religious prophets and teachers had. You know that it's something in the brain that is a nonverbal experience which was really helpful because well, we can discuss that later, but the interpretation of nonverbal experience has got us into a lot of hot water. This is a nonverbal intuitive perception that we now know how it works, and that is a latent capacity in all of us. Well, many people feel a sense of communion with God, and I think that may be what you're referring to when you talk about this nonverbal sensibility. That's that's probably a sign of it. Yes, I mean you you can, as as Bob describes in the book, it's based on the foundation really of connection of when we became when we stood up. Suddenly there was, we could see in the far distance, and that created a, a different uh, sense of awe of of something other, and that gave people the sense that there is some meaning and that has been developed since the uh, built on the idea of of god of this transient being if you like one of the other notions that you describe as being common to people everywhere and in, in every religious tradition and, and type of culture is is the division into a threefold universe, the upper world, the heavens, the physical world that we live in, and then a lower world, like a, a hellish, a demonic world. Uh, th that seemed to be quite universal. So even in uh, the title of this interview, uh, we talk about higher consciousness as if it's somehow up above us. Yes, that, that's true. And it, it really, um, that was again David Lewis Williams finding, um, that really interested Bob. I was working on Paleolithic paint, uh, I was looking at Paleolithic paintings because I was interested from an art point of view. And then, then the, David Lewis Williams got Bob all interested into this idea that from the very beginning, the, the caves show it, there was this higher, uh, where the gods, where the spirit world is, you see in um, Les, Les Trois Frères, the sorcerer, is way, way high above where anybody could conceivably get to. And the, the, where the ceremonies took place was at ground level, and then below that were, were the death, nasty bits, you know, evil spirits and so on. And that has, that's gone, that's the way we look at the world from from then on now you can see it in our churches you have the the spirals and the 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 crypt below and where the where we all are striving to get to the to the spirals spirals and also in in for example mosques the same thing and it's all it's also interesting that that what what bob found out was even where you place things on a computer screen people more easily um recognize negative things if they're below on the screen and positive things if they're above. So it's very hardwired into us. And it probably, there's other evidence which we mention in the book that it, it in, from one, uh, from one point of view, it, it comes from childhood. I mean, when you're, when you're a baby, you look up. Every, everything that's, that you've got to learn really is up there. There's your, your adults. There's the, you, you know, you're, you're sort of hoping you're at sort of thigh, uh, knee level or something, and you're wanting everything that's good is up there. When you want to be picked up, you cry, you're up. So this has, has paid a, 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 a great part in, in how consciousness was constructed. And another thing that Lewis Williams recognized that there are three levels of consciousness in the trance experience. And that has also been found to be universal, which is interesting. And it, it was very interesting because when we when we did the this research on transcendence, we found that it, it couldn't possibly be cross cultural. All these, it's ubiquitous, but it all developed of its own, uh, uniquely in different parts of the world. So we know that it is something innate in us. It's not something that we get by contact with someone else. 
And that we, and from that, we can understand that we can build on this experience of an altered state of consciousness. We can develop it. Well, I know many psychological and spiritual traditions talk about the idea that you, you can't just go up into higher consciousness and, and ignore the lower levels. The Jungians, for example, refer to shadow work. And in Rudolf Steiner's Anthroposophy, they talk about the, the need to confront the demonic figures, the guardian of the threshold in spiritual initiation. We, we have to go through the dark side in order to uh, achieve the uh, heavenly realms. Does Bob speak to that in your book? I, I don't think he would describe it as um, quite that way. What he's, what we're talking about is the ability to switch modes of consciousness, to switch from normal consciousness to a, a more holistic, more intuitive, expanded perceptive ability that is nonverbal, but that can work along beside you. And that actually is working. It's a, there's a Sufi story about the fish, fish not recognizing the water they're swimming in. I mean, it, this other alternative way of looking at things, as you mentioned, when you're looking into the distance, is there and you can cultivate it. So I think it's not, not much. Um, uh, I think what, he, what Bob would say is that normal consciousness and he's described it in the evolution of consciousness and in mind, multi mind is a is a bunch of really undisciplined simpletons. There's multi minds. They're all telling you do this, do that, do the other. And why teachers recommend self observation is you have to get these multi minds under control in order to develop this other perception. So you have to have self knowledge. You have to know what your propensities, what negative propensities you, ha you have that get in the way of your being able to perceive the other. So that you're not trapped, for example, in emotionality or in uh, poor me, I didn't do whatever, 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 and the negative side of things. No, you're trying to just switch out of that, change, change your point of, change your aspect, change your view. Whoops, that's not me. I'm switching over to the other one. So I think what Bob talks about um, in the, not in God, but in evolution of consciousness is getting, getting the conductor and finding the, the, the con yourself, the part of yourself that can orchestrate these multiple minds to give you the space to move out of normal consciousness into an alternate, alternate view, a more holistic view. It sounds to me as if what you're saying is that a self-aware individual recognizes that this higher consciousness that, that we're referring to, this holistic awareness, and uh, I'll call it communion with the divine, is, is actually a natural state, but we block ourselves from it because we get caught up in the, the trivialities of ego existence. Actually, I, I absolutely, I, I and I found it fascinating when you think of it. Back in pe the Ice Age, I mean, they reckon there are about five people per, per forty kilometers in the Ice Age, and but we survive. Now we couldn't possibly su have survived by trial and error. There must have been something going on in our brains, as we say in the book, that is now taken up with ledgers and technology and typing and reading and and one of the we quote one of the the sufis as saying we cannot teach you without words because now you're you've grown up on words but in in earlier times we had other faculties i mean even today some some tribes are known to be able to find themselves no matter where they are. Now, if you, if it, it's me, that, that faculty is certainly gone. gone. <laughs> Thank heavens for GPSs. I mean, I, but you know, our brains have adapted and, and people have noticed now with technology, with computers, how people's kids' brains have changed again, you know, I mean, to accommodate something new. So I think that, that if you like, what we have to remember now is, that we know how to develop this other intuitive perception and it doesn't get in the way of our everyday 
life. It just is ancillary to that and can inform it. Now, I happen to be very interested in parapsychology and the paranormal, and I know it's a topic that's touched on in the book briefly. You were able to identify, I think, certain personality characteristics who, uh, for individuals who seem more open to paranormal experience than others. Yes, Bob describes this um, very well, but um, it, it, what they found was um, in the brain, there are barriers, thick barriers and thin barriers. It's the genetic, I think. And it's sort of, if you imagine that the, the, the typical view would be the artist versus the engineer. The, uh, the people with thin barriers are much more um, able to, for example, when they did studies of, of doing um, splashes, on a, on a wall, um, people with thin barriers make sense of those splashes. They, they see in them shapes that, that are more, I don't know, more real. I actually work that way when I'm painting. I put music on and splash and see what it tells me. So that's the kind of thing I understand. But with people who are more thick barriered, they are religious. They're formal religion versus spiritual, spiritually inclined. And they tend to know what's right or wrong. So they need to know what's right and what's wrong. So they are less um, available to the other side of the brain. They have to, they, if, if they wanted to develop that, it would be um, a somewhat harder job, but, that, but it's still latent in everybody. So it's not impossible. And we all have our things that get in the way of being able to develop it. So it's work. <laughs> well, you know, as I think about the many Sufi stories of Idris Shah and the, the Sufi tradition in general, which is an enormous tradition, one gets a sense that there's a kind of historical opposition in many periods, not all, I suppose, between the Sufis and the upholders of orthodoxy within Islam and, and also in other religions. The mystics often seem to be at odds with the upholders of orthodoxy. Yes, and it developed, as we say in the book, it developed once populations grew because you needed to control them. So you're no longer talking about a personal experience. That That's something, if you have a personal experience, you, you're doing your own thing. We can't, you know, it, it's your, your, your sense you have to have control when you're beginning societies. In, and I think in those days, I mean, it's interesting, in Neolithic times, they had this amazing ability to, to understand science, and they constructed these temples, like in, in, in Malta, the temples, they constructed them so you can't get in. They're locked so that you so that it keeps people out. So the high priests and the, pre and the priests kept, were, were in and were controlling everything. The same with the ziggurats in Mesopotamia, you know, only very few people went there. So you develop this hierarchy because having a personal experience is threatening. And I think that's still perpetuated in some senses, not now, but uh, certainly in the Middle Ages, you saw it. Um, as far as the, um, in Islam, I think while that fundamentalism was going on, and we, we address it in the book during what they call the golden age of Islam from the 9th to the 13th century, there were both, I mean, there were threats to, um, to that to intuitive perception, but at the same time, they were extraordinary people who, in that same era that, that were um, able, were very, very talented and were polymaths able to do, understood so much and informed our, our, our renaissance actually. Um, but at the same time, there were these nut, fundamentalist nutters taking over every five minutes and it was difficult and it's pretty much been consistently the same. <laughs> I, I think, I mean, we've got our own version of it now, right?
Certainly, if we look at the history of Islam, there were some great Sufis who, who talked about the inner and the outer world merging, uh, who were executed for saying those things. Absolutely. Um, for example, in the 10th century, there's a Sufi called Halaj who said, I am the truth. And he got beheaded for blasphemy. Now, you, you think, well, why did he say that? He said that because by saying that, you shock people and you activate that second system of consciousness. So what he was doing was providing the instrumentation to switch. And that's what a lot of the Sufi materials do. I mean, all of them, actually. So when, and, and um, you can see it in our, uh, in Christianity, Jesus said, I am the truth, the way and the life, you know, I mean, so this idea of, it's not literally, I am, well, it is in a sense, it's literally, but it's not, I mean, who knows what that means other than metaphorically, really. One of the characteristics of orthodox thinking seems to be to take religious scriptures of various types absolutely literally, whereas many mystical teachers uh, suggest that there's a metaphoric interpretation. I think that's very important. And I think that is what has caused a lot of the uh, battles between religion and science. Because I don't think, I think if you're talking about the son of God, for example, when we looked into the research of, of the, the the idea of the Son of God began with in Mesopotamia. One of the kings became, I, I forget his name, but he became the Son of God. He made himself the Son of God. And then it became an honorific in a sense. And as it goes through, and especially um, with stories, when when people write it down, it becomes static and it's in the old days storytelling was adapted to time and place and circumstances and people would change the story and plagiarism was something that was non-existent you didn't own a story that's why for example there are two genesises they were for two different times and um, periods and when none of these stories were supposed to be taken literally they were metaphorical well it seems as if in your work, you're suggesting that we can now look at science, we can now look at the brain, and, and see that these experiences are innate. People are having real experiences that point towards the divine. Yes, absolutely. The divine being a higher perceptive capacity. It really is now the time, as Bob would say, the mantra is, it's not what you believe, it's what you perceive. And I think that's really the thing to keep in mind, and that we have this ability to perceive a lot more, and that will inform our words, our actions. And you can develop it through as, I don't know, I mean, for Bob and I, it is using this, the Sufi material, the materials that Idris Shah has, has written, and it's working with teaching stories and narratives and studying those that have really informed, informed Bob's work right since the 70s. And so I think it's valuable for those that are interested. It's a way to, you can choose that. Let me reflect on uh, an interview that I did with Bob many decades ago after he had written, as I recall, New World, New Mind, a, a book co-authored with Paul Ehrlich. And in, in that interview, he made a point of saying, when we look at the environment, it's changing, it's getting worse. It's pollution is becoming a problem, but it's happening so slowly. We're like the frog who is in a pot of water that is heating up, heating up until it boils, but the frog never notices the change because it's happening so slowly. And he said, we're wired to only react when a tiger jumps out of the bushes at us for a sudden threat to our survival. And these slow things, our brain isn't wired to appreciate, but we have to learn to do that. We have to learn new ways of perceiving these slowly moving changes, or we're going to be uh, like the frog in boiling water. We'll get caught. Yes, and I think that's pretty obvious now with climate change. You know, I mean, it's interesting because I, I think we don't realize, it's almost like you, you, you have this coating over your brain. You think, I remember with, with the um, Kyoto, um, when the climate change 
meeting and the little guy, uh, the president of the Maldives stood up and said, if we don't do something about climate change, my, my country's going to disappear. And I, I, and I thought, well, we're bound to then, aren't we? But we didn't. And that's, I think, just shows you that we're not in the right mindset. That's an example of us not being in the right mindset. We have to be able to really get rid of the me first. The, this, I've got to survive. I've got to bother about me because we can survive if we switch over to um, a more holistic, perceptive way of understanding the world and ourselves as being connected. Would you say it's fair to say then that at, at that time, many decades ago when I interviewed Bob, he, he's suggesting we have to learn to think in a way that's different than the way our brain normally works. And now you seem to be saying actually that if we pay attention to the way our brain normally enters into states of transcendence, we can naturally get there. I think so, yes. I mean, I, I don't think it's difficult because you it's nothing it's not like educating in the in the in the sense that we know now, which is more like sort of you repeat, you condition people. It's we need to choose choose um think the the the, the ability has to be provoked. So it's a much gentler thing. Bob used to say, we don't know, some, we don't necessarily have to know that it works. I make a left turn. If I made a right turn, maybe I would have had a car crash. Who knows? So it's that kind of, it's elusive, but it, you, you, you do become used to, um, it's the atmosphere, is what say. Uh, if you, but you can't force it and it just, you need to just, I think, choose things that will provoke it. And the use of Sufi stories. I know your book concludes with a few lengthy Sufi stories from Idri Shah. Seems like a very gentle, loving, even funny way of sort of teasing the mind to enter into a, a new way of perceiving things. Yes. And I, I think it really, it has to be that way because you have to forget about, as I said, the me first, the, the, the wanting to be emotional about something. I want the answers now, you know, as, as Shah would say, give, give me $30 and in 15 minutes, I'll, I, I'll take my $30 and in 15 minutes, I'll know about higher consciousness. You know, that kind of thing is totally not going to work. It's a very much more subtle thing. Um, but it can be encouraged. And I think that's the, uh, really, I'd like to also say the way we end the book is to talk about what, what we need to do with our educational system. And that's been something that Bob's always wanted to ensure that this um, ability is fostered. And I think the first thing that we need to, which he would say we need to do is we need to understand who we are. What is normal consciousness and what are we capable of? So who we are now and who we are potentially, we need to understand how to achieve our potential and not discourage creativity and um, in the sciences and in, in the arts to actually do the reverse. Because with creativity, when it really works, as you see, uh, as others have written about, like Csikszentmihalyi writes about flow, you're not... You're not there when, when, when a painting really works. I'm not involved, you know, it, and that's this kind of um, aspect that we need to encourage so that something else is informing you that you don't necessarily have to focus on, but it, it works. It, it, it suggests to me that you need to at least uh, allow it to emerge. Yes, yes. Uh, sort of have time out from yourself. It's quite, quite a good idea. <laughs> That's a beautiful phrase, time out from yourself. Well, Sally Malam Ornstein, this has been a delightful conversation. I'm so glad that we reconnected. I feel like we're reconnecting because I knew Bob decades ago, even though I've just met you for the first time. But it's wonderful that you're keeping his important work alive. So I'm uh, very grateful for your time and the ability to share your insights with our audience. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it, Jeff. And for those of you 
listening or watching. Thank you for being with us. Thank you.